Tonight we have just an exciting person here to talk with you. It's Dr. Melanie Spencer, and she's going to talk about gut microbes. Now that doesn't sound real exciting or real special, but I bet you before she gets finished tonight, you'll be glad you know all about gut microbes. Um, Dr. Spencer's career has followed a very interesting path, and I think it's very um, interesting the way she has ended up where she is tonight. She developed a passion for science at a very early age, and she ended up completing her undergraduate degree at UNC Chapel Hill, and, and she majored in, I get this, she majored in German and economics. So, but that's not the end of her career. After graduating from college, uh, she became successful in the banking um, industry where she worked for 18 years. She ended her banking career at Bank of America as a manager of a group that determined where bank, bank branches ought to be built or closed, a job that left her on the road about 30% of the time. With two children to raise, and we all know about this, she decided to leave the banking industry in 2000 uh, as, uh, um, and to become just a full-time mother. A few years later, her children were leaving for college, and she found herself ready to restart her career. And then she decided to follow her passion, which was, has always been science. Melanie went back to school, got her Ph.D. in bioinformatics and computational biology. Now, I had biology, but I think when you cook computational to it, it must make it really hard, <laughs> at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. She's currently completing a two-year fellowship with the UNC Chapel uh, Hill School of Medicine where Dr. Steven Zizel, who we all heard last week, serves as her mentor. At the uh, Nutrition Inst in in Research Institute, Dr. Sp uh, Spencer is exploring the relationship between bacteria and human uh, metabolism and the effects on chronic disease. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Melanie Spencer. Is that working? Yes. Yay. First time. Thank you, Gail. I have a couple of reminders for everybody. Um, this is at the very beginning. Let's see. And let me get sorted out here. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. First, the first reminder is next Tuesday, Dr. Philip May will be here talking about uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. And actually, he's here tonight. Dr. May, if you'll stand up. Dr. May? Ah, here he is. He's way behind the column over there, so he's hard to see. Um, but he'll be here next week talking about fetal alcohol syndrome, and that will be a fascinating presentation. Um, the second announcement I have is in, the po in your pocket, you received an evaluation form. Please don't forget to fill it out, and we'll thank you in advance uh, for filling it out and turning it in. And then the last one we have before we get started is a special thanks again to our sponsor, Carolina's Medical Center Northeast. Um, thank you very much um, for everything you do to help us get this seminar series in place. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> I have to begin with two confessions. Um, the first confession is I have lost 99 million microbes in your handouts. Now don't get alarmed. It's okay, they're really tiny. What I mean by that is there's a typo in your handout. It says, and I said 99 million and I did it again, 99 trillion microbes. It's actually supposed to read 100 trillion microbes, 100 trillion tiny friends for life, not just a trillion. And that's a big difference. But it's kind of hard to know what 100 trillion is, isn't it? Um, the second confession I have is that I have shamelessly exploited my children's baby pictures for this presentation. <laughs> and I hope you enjoy them as much as I do. <laughs> okay, well, we'll get started. Okay, and I've got this right. Um, it's really hard to believe how many bacteria you have in your gastrointestinal tract. You have 10 times as many bacteria as you have cells in your body, if you can believe that. And 100, they, whoops, 
Am I doing? Ah, sorry, my bad. Ah, uh, this is turning. There we go. <laughs> okay, so you have 10 times uh, the number of bacterial cells in your body, in your gut only, um, as you do cells in your body. And there are 100 times more genes in the bacteria than you have genes in your body, which is kind of hard to believe. The microbes that inhabit your GI tract influence everything from your immunity to how much nutrition you get out of the foods you eat. And they're like a fingerprint. Each person's community is distinct and individual. Scientists are really only beginning to figure out what the system is all about, how it develops over a lifetime, what factors are important in influencing the composition, um, which microbes live in the gastro uh, gastrointestinal tract, and how it interacts with the rest of our bodies over the course of our lifetime. As we begin to understand more about these tiny constant companions that are a part of our lives forever, um, we are uncovering how the community um, can end up chaotic and in, can influence chronic disease and how nurturing your microbiome can actually make you healthier. Now for the exploitation. Okay, <laughs> this is my daughter. <laughs> so what do a baby and a coral reef have in common? It's not just that they're beautiful, even though they are beautiful. I can say that, I'm the mom. Um, but they're also both home to a beneficial, thriving community of microbes that support life on this earth. Microbes inhabit virtually every environment on our planet. They are essential members of each environment. They degrade toxic compounds, and they also shuttle nutrients back and forth to other members of the community. Bacteria also play a very important role in the global ecosystem. Um, they're very important for recycling nitrogen and carbon and sulfur, um, and they make really life on Earth possible in ways that it's hard to imagine. Um, different types of bacteria need different environments to survive. You have aerobic bacteria that need oxygen. You have anaerobic bacteria that actually can't really survive in an environment with oxygen. And then you have facultative bacteria that really like an oxygen environment, but they'll also live without it. It's uh, really easy to see, well, whoops, backwards. It's easy to see how a pond could be a good environment for a lot of microbes. Um, but there are some environments on the planet where it's really hard to believe that anything could survive, much less thrive in them. Uh, one of these that you see on the left is an acid mine, is acid mine runoff, um, and the other on the right is a deep sea vent. Environments with extreme conditions like these acid mines and deep sea vents hardly seem capable of supporting anything at all, but they actually do. Um, scientists identified the presence of microorganisms in acid mines back in 1947, so quite a long time ago, but really until the early 2000s, they couldn't identify which microbes were there, or what the diversity was like in the environment. And what they found when they did is that there were a lot more there than they thought there were. The vents that are shown here are um, from the Champagne Bay in Dominica. Because of the extreme temperature, the only organisms that live there are bacteria. Um, and they form mats um, kind of around the vents and in the vents. And not only do they survive, but they also use the harsh chemicals as a source of energy um, and find a way in those environments to thrive. Um, one of these bacteria is very important, um, Thermus aquaticus. Uh, it actually was a source of a very important discovery called TAC polymerase, which is an enzyme. Um, this enzyme uh, allows the sequencing that helps identify which bacteria are in these environments. Um, it allows that to happen. And it is actually uh, one of the most important enzymes for my work because I study DNA sequence, which we will talk about in a little bit. The other thing that's important is that microbes dominate the human body. Um, this figure is from a study published in 2009 that surveyed almost every body part you can think of. 
both ears, both palms, inside the elbow, the gut, the mouth, the hair, everything. Um, and you can see what they found when they did the survey. Um, each of the, uh, that's a little hard to see, but I'll, I'll try to give you a little bit of a description of it. Each of the pie charts in the center of each circle are the major groups of bacteria. And one of the things that's important, um, more important than anything else, is you'll see they all look different. None of them are alike. And even they found that the palms of the hand, left and right, were a little bit different from one another. Um, in some ways, um, you can also see, well, let's see. You can also see the outer ring around it, and that shows the smaller groups of bacteria that are also in the communities. Um, each of these different communities has many, many microbial members, um, and they are all different. The vast majority are symbiotic, which means that uh, they provide things for the human body, and the human body in return uh, provides a place for them to live. Um, and they're not harmful. They, import, they uh, perform very important functions. So for example, there is a bacteria called E. coli that lives in your gastrointestinal tract, and E. coli is able to synthesize vitamin K. Um, and vitamin K is a very important vitamin for bone metabolism. So you've got to have it, and the bacteria actually are able to make it and help you, um, and you also help them uh, by pro providing a habitat. The bacteria living in each part of the body are very specialized. Um, what's more, uh, the bacteria living in the gastrointestinal tract of, say, you, are completely different from the bacteria tra uh, in the gastrointestinal tract living in one of you over here. And even if you two were identical twins, the bacteria would still be different in the gastrointestinal tract of the identical twins. I included the word microbiome on this slide, and I'll tell you a little bit about what that is because I'll use that term over and over again. Um, the microbiome is the microbial community, but it's also all of its genetic material and all of the interactions that it has in an environment. And so that's the microbiome. It composed, is composed of all of those things. The bacteria, uh, what the bacteria are doing, and the genetic material that the bacteria have. So let's talk about how we know all about this. How do we know who's there or what's there? How do we know what they're doing? How do we know why they're important? The technology we use to understand microbes and microbial communities has changed very rapidly. When I started my graduate work, we looked at microbial uh, communities using one technology um, in 2007 that by the time I graduated in 2011 was completely old school and obsolete. And so it's changing very rapidly and it's still continuing to change. I'll spend a few minutes talking about the methods that we use to tell us about which microbial communities are there. Then we'll spend some time talking about uh, where the microbiome comes from, um, and this is the gut microbiome we're going to focus on, the importance of diet and nutrition to the gut microbiome, um, and then also the role of that community in human health. Unfortunately, we'll only scratch the surface of this topic, um, but let's start first by finding out how scientists understand microbes. This is a Petri dish with a bunch of E. coli in it um, from an experiment that I did way back when I was in grad school, which I guess wasn't that long ago. Um, this is the way that scientists understood uh, microbes for a very long time. Um, they used specialized media to grow the microbes, and this picture um, shows that they generally, especially if they're aerobic, like to grow on media. However, um, even though culturing bacteria was critical to dis the discovery of antibiotic therapy, culture has its limitations. And one of the limitations is that 99% of the human-associated bacteria, the bacteria that grow in your body, can't be cultured. Now, culturing methods are developing. We're getting better at it. It's probably less than 99% now. But for the most part, they can't be cultured. Um, the other thing that culturing did for us is because you were generally uh, culturing one microbe, type of microbe at a time, and a lot of the motivation for culturing those microbes was to understand disease, 
um, a lot of what they found were pathogenic microbes. And those microbes kind of dominated how people thought about bacteria. And in some ways, I think they still do. Um, people think of bacteria as germs, not as um, organisms that can help us so much. There was really little understanding of microbes in a community, um, which is something that we're now beginning to um, uncover as we study the DNA and the bacteria. So let's take a look at how we do that. This is a very simple, simple cartoon um, of technology advances in DNA sequencing, and this is only one method um, that we use for DNA sequencing. So part of what we do when we want to know what is in, um, what microbes are in a bacterial community um, is we take the DNA from all of the bacteria, we extract the DNA from the sample, and we amplify a part of the DNA that serves as a code to us to tell us which bacteria are there. Um, our lab uses the 16S ribosomal, ribosomal RNA I can't talk, ribosomal RNA gene. And we sequence that gene because it tends to be different in almost every type of bacteria, just a little different. And so it acts like a name card. Um, we look at the DNA sequence and we're able to say this is that bacteria or this bacteria. And so it gives us a completer view of the community than we would have by just culturing the community. Um, one of the things you'll notice is um, that we use a barcode, a primer and a barcode. The primer helps us amplify the bacteria. Um, the barcode tells us which sample it's from. So all of the bacteria goes in together, but it's like a barcode on a, um, on a product. It will allow us to pull out um, and separate se uh, sequences that are from one sample or from a different sample. So what do you actually get when you come out of this process? Um, it's a bunch of letters, <laughs> really. Um, and it's also a code. So um, you'll notice this is an actual sequence, um, one of 400,000 that I got when we sequenced um, samples from the human gut microbiome. So we had 400,000 of these things. Um, and they were uh, used to tell what types of bacteria were in the different samples. So you have 400,000 16S RNA gene sequences. Each of them has a tag made up of the four nucleotides that are in the sequences, A, C, G, and T, so it's DNA sequence. And that, set, that sequence is used to uh, identify the bacteria that it came from. In this case, this specific sequence that you see um, is from a bacteria called Prevotella. And Prevotella is a normal part of your GI tract, um, but it also colonizes the mouth, and some types will actually cause infection, cause skin infections as well. So it's, it's a pretty utilitarian type of bacteria, um, but it is in your G, GI tract, um, and it's normal. Part of my job is taking that big data set of 400,000 sequences and writing the code that first pulls the sequences out by sample, then figures out which sequences belong to which types of bacteria, and then catalogs and counts the bacteria. Because it's important to know in each sample what type of bacteria you have and how many of them you have in a particular sample so that when you're doing some, um, some sort of research study, which we'll talk about more in a minute, you're able to determine if those bacteria have anything to do with what you see in your experiment, whether or not they're associated with the outcome of the experiment. So again, we look at the sample, we count the bacteria, um, and we associate that with a specific subject um, who has an out, some sort of health outcome from the experiment. Now I'm going to talk specifically uh, about the gut microbiome. This diagram describes a very complicated set of interactions, um, and I tried to think of it in a way um, that was a little bit more straightforward. Many factors influence which bacteria end up um, in your gastrointestinal tract and stay there. Um, you have diet and nutrition, which interacts with the bacteria and actually 
can change which bacteria are there. Um, the bacteria also influence nutrition, as we talked about a minute ago. You've got bacteria that synthesize vitamin K. They also synthesize B6, B12, niacin, um, tetra I can't say it, tetrahydrofolate. They also synthesize tetrahydrofolate. And so they're very important in getting the nutrition out of the food you eat. Um, in addition to that, a person's genetics can influence which bacteria are there. So the genetics can set up the gastrointestinal tract in such a way that it has a certain pH, um, and that affects whether or not the, the microbes will colonize um, the gastrointestinal tract. Other host factors are also important, things like how much a person exercises, chronic stress levels, um, even exposure to sunlight can change the bacteria in, the, in your microbiome. There's also tremendous evidence that the gut microbiome has a role in a whole range of conditions. Some are things that you would expect, like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, because they're a part of your gastrointestinal tract. Those are diseases of the gastrointestinal tract, so it makes sense that microbes might have a role in that. Others, including diabetes, um, heart disease, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease are actually quite a surprise, and these are things that we're just learning about um, how the microbiome has a role in those types of diseases. But where do those interactions come from? Where does this gut microbiome begin? Now, this is my son. <laughs> I have to get them both in or they'll be a little bit jealous of each other. Um, this is when he was a brand new baby. You can even see the hospital bracelet on his uh, wrist. Um, he arrived here sterile, completely alone. He had no tiny microbial friends at all. And like most babies, he was given a shot of vitamin K. Guess why? He didn't have any E. coli to make it. He was not really alone for very long, though. Um, just like every other human being on the planet, he quickly became home for trillions of microbes. Um, these important companions were largely determined by the circumstances of his birth. For most people, nature's plan to colonize the uh, gut with beneficial bacteria works very well. A mom's birth canal provides um, seeding for bacteria to grow in the gastro gastrointestinal tract and, in fact, um, all over the baby's skin as well. And through that, you develop the right kind of bacteria that helps set your immune system um, and help you develop going forward. However, this plan doesn't really always work completely as intended. Um, and this is, these are a few statistics from the news. Um, cesarean births are up in the United States and actually around the world. And some of that is unavoidable. Um, we have more multiple births, so some people are having uh, cesareans because they have no choice. But there are also other people who are um, having cesareans for a, um, an elective procedure for a lot of different reasons. And some of those reasons are very good, but it often happens. Um, and a lot of times what happens um, to the baby when a cesarean um, section is performed, the baby doesn't get the same microbes um, that they would get if they were born uh, through the birth canal and delivered uh, naturally. What you'll see on the right is a um, chart that shows the types of bacteria um, you find in different places on a woman's body. So the vaginal bacteria are shown in lighter pink, and the cesarean, uh, or I'm sorry, the, my bad, the vaginal bacteria are shown in darker pink, uh, the cesarean uh, bacteria are in light blue, uh, the skin bacteria are in dark blue, and what you'll see is the dark blue and the light blue bacteria cluster together. They're alike. So the babies born by cesareans start out with skin bacteria in their gut microbiome, whereas the babies that are born vaginally start out with the vaginal bacteria. Now, what this does is, because your immune system develops um, some from the bacteria in your gut, it tends to change that immune system development, and they find that cesarean birth children sometimes will have more allergies, uh, more asthma, um, and other things like that. This is a little bit more detail 
um, on cesarean and vaginal births. So if you look at the bar chart on the top left corner, um, what it shows on the, uh, the y-axis, the one that goes up and down, it shows the distance uh, um, or the difference between uh, the, bar the bars on the bar chart. So, for example, if you look at uh, number one on that top bar graph, you'll see that the own baby vaginally delivered has the shortest bar chart in, uh, or bar in white. So it's the shortest bar on the far left-hand side. What that means is that microbiome in the baby is closest to the mother. If you look at the second bar in number one, you'll see other babies vaginally delivered are not at all like that mother. That's the dark bar in the middle, and the higher it is, the more different they are. And you'll also see that other babies cesarean delivered are also different. So in general, the mother's vaginal delivery is going to be much more like uh, the, ba the, va the vagina is going to be much more like uh, the baby, the mother and the baby will be. Cesarean delivery, you see the own baby and the vagina are not at all alike. That's the bar chart at the bottom. What's also interesting is the bacteria are very different. So you see on the right-hand side chart, each of the bacteria are a different color in the bar. And the first two bar, the first bar is um, the mother's oral cavity, which is very different from all of them. The second two bars are the vagina and a vaginal birth. And then the third are the cesarean birth and the mother's skin bacteria. So they all look a little bit alike. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about immune development and why it's important. First, something most people don't know. The gastrointestinal tract is the very largest immune system organ in your entire body. Gut bacteria can directly inhibit the growth of pathogens in your GI tract. Strangely, the gut bacteria can secrete antimicrobial peptides that get rid of the pathogens, that get rid of the bad bacteria. So they operate kind of as a first responder in your gut to get rid of the bugs that will make you sick. This is a very busy slide um, about how the gut microbiome promotes the immune system development. I'll go through the different parts of it very quickly. Um, the brush border of your intestinal tract are the cells in pink. You can see them, they look like they've got little fingers sticking up. Um, and that's part of your gastrointestinal tract cells. An immune cell, which is shown in yellow, is down at the bottom, and you can see it kind of sticking a finger up between the cells. Um, that immune system cell samples the bacteria in your gut uh, to figure out what's there so it can educate the other immune system cells in your body. Um, the third thing I want to point out um, is that you've got nutrients that are coming into the system, and they're in the blue. They're the little blue dots up there. And a couple of things happen. First of all, you've got nutrients that are not modified, and they have signals that go to your gut as well. Um, then you've also got nutrients that are modified by the microbes, and they send an entirely different set of signals. You have vitamins like vitamin A, which can change the gut microbes and also change the signals that they provide to the immune system. So what all of this means is that the immune system starting out in a baby and actually all the way through life is very dependent on what's in your gut microbiome. The sampling that goes on with the immune cells help your body understand which microbes are good, which microbes are bad, when do you need to launch an attack when you've got something invading, and when do you really just need to leave it alone and not have any sort of response. That helps set things up so that you don't have an autoimmune reaction or overreact to things uh, that you shouldn't be ever reacting to in your immunity. This continues over the course of your entire life. Many immune system components are tailored um, from a person's environment, and they develop as the person develops. So you would think that your immune system gets into place fairly quickly. Actually, it doesn't. It takes quite a while for different components, especially things uh, like some of the antibodies and some of the T uh, cell independent 
um, antibody response to get into place. And so all of the things that you encounter over your lifetime are also setting up your immune system to function properly. Next, we're going to shift gears a little bit um, and talk about diet and nutrition. Okay, there we go. Diet and nutrition and how they interact with the uh, gut microbiome. It's actually kind of hard to believe that anything you would eat might change a community of organisms, but it actually can. The things you eat do have an effect on the gut microbiome. It has an effect on who's there. It has an effect on what they're doing. Um, what sort of things they're producing, and so it's very important. Um, we're also going to talk about how very different diets can influence microbiome composition. Um, and I think that's probably one of the things that I've found most interesting um, over the course of uh, the research that I've done. First, let's talk a little bit um, about how the gut microbiome develops with the diet. Um, the diagram on the right uh, shows how the gut microbiome changes at birth um, and over time to more closely resemble the adult microbiome. So what you have here is a chart that shows similarity. So when you are in the bottom left-hand corner of the chart, um, you are less, the, the um, microbiome is less similar to an adult. On the bottom of the chart, you have the number of days that the baby has been on earth. Um, so what you find is as you go through the number of days, the microbiome becomes more and more like that of an adult. So it goes further up and to the right and becomes more like an adult. You'll also notice that at the very beginning, you've got a lot of uh, different levels of similarity of the different babies to the adult microbiome, their gut microbiomes to the adult microbiome. At the very beginning, this whole process is kind of chaotic. Um, but then as they begin to uh, sample the environment and get more microbes, it becomes more, uh, uh, more smooth and they begin to look more and more like an adult rather than being a very chaotic sort of development. So what do we know about the effects of more significant differences in diet? I'm going to talk about a study that was done um, in children in Florence, Italy and Burkina Faso. Uh, Florence, Italy is, is obviously in Europe. Um, Burkina Faso is in the western part of Africa. Um, and all the children from both of the countries who were in this study were healthy and well-nourished. Um, they also made the study where the children were of similar ages so that they would be able to compare them easier. Um, the pictures illustrate that there are very significant differences in the environments in these two areas. Um, one of them is an urban area. It's highly populated. Um, it's a big city. Um, the other is rural and sparsely populated and quite secluded. The children in Burkina Faso who were in this study were mostly from the same um, ethnicity, the Messi ethnicity, and they were all from the same small village. Um, the children in Florence were not in the same family group or related in any way. Um, and there are other pretty significant differences between the two groups of children. Um, in Italy, most of the children were on a Western diet that was fairly low in fiber, high in animal protein, sugar, starch, fat, kind of a typical Western diet. I know, I eat it too. <laughs> um, but they also uh, had more processed foods now, they were breastfed for up to a year, which is good, um, and their calories were a good bit higher than those of the kids in Burkina Faso. Those children, um, and there were 14 of them, had a just typical rural African diet, predominantly cereals, legumes, um, beans of all sorts, vegetables. It was low in fat, low in animal protein, but rich in starch, fiber, plant polysaccharides, and most of it was cultivated locally. So right around the village, they cultivated what they were eating. These children were breastfed up to about two years. Um, the types of the bacteria that they found, which is the thing they looked at next, were very different in these two populations. Um, what you can see are the two pie charts on the left-hand side of the um, slide. The top one is from the children in Burkina Faso, and each color represents a different type of bacteria. Um, what you can see is that there are 
a lot of green bacteria, which are bacteroides, um, in the Burkina Faso children. You don't really see a lot of that at all in the EU children. They mostly have a group called Firmicutes. Um, and the children's microbiomes are entirely different. The point of this study was to make um, the observation that diets affected the microbiome. And we'll talk about that observation a little bit more in a minute. Um, what you can also see from the top bar chart um, is that you've got something called SCFA, and that's, that's short-chain fatty acids. Short-chain fatty acids are made from a lot of undigestible fibers and other polysaccharides in the diet. They actually promote the health of your gastrointestinal tract, um, and they are uh, actually quite good for you. You see a whole lot less short-chain fatty acids. Um, that's the gray bar instead of the black bar in the children um, that are from Florence, Italy. They are not getting as much short-chain fatty acids. And in fact, when they looked at the fecal content of short-chain fatty acids, they actually looked at the stool of the children and they said, okay, are there short-chain fatty acids in there? They saw a lot of short-chain fatty acids in the kids from Burkina Faso, which is really amazing because those short-chain fatty acids are absorbed very well by the colon because they love them. It, it really helps the health of the cells. Um, and so you could see that they had an excess supply, whereas there were almost none in um, the children from Florence, Italy. Um, you can also see um, in the bar chart below that, so it's the bar underneath, you've got tall gray bars. The gray bars represent intestinal microbes that are from um, Enterobacteriaceae, the Enterobacteriaceae family. Um, those include E. coli, Shigella, um, Salmonella, which I'm sure you've heard of before. They tend to produce gastrointestinal diseases, and the um, children in Italy had more of the disease-producing sorts of bacteria um, than did the kids in Burkina Faso, um, and that also correlates probably coincidentally, but maybe not, um, with the higher levels of gastrointestinal disease in the Western world. But the big question is, could other factors be at work? So one of the things that's very hard about human studies is you've got a lot of variables going on. Um, and you'll note at the beginning we talked about there were differences in the environment. Could that have affected the differences in the microbiome? It's hard to know. What about genetics? These are um, children from very different genetic backgrounds, and that could also have influenced um, what they saw in terms of the diet um, and health and the microbiome and differences between the two groups. So in human studies, sometimes it's very hard. So one of the things we want to do is try to look at how do we control some of the variables that we have in human studies. And the way we do that is by looking at mouse models. And in mouse models, it's great because you can control genetics um, and you can have exactly the same genetic background in a mouse, in another mouse, in another mouse, and you can do the same experiment on them or you can do different experiments and see how the results come out, but the genetic background is controlled. Other host factors, because you're controlling their cage environment, are also um, not as variable as they might be otherwise. Diet and nutrition are also something that we're going to take a look at um, in this group. Now, this is the first study of the gut microbiome that I ever read. And this actually is what sent me into this field. <laughs> um, this, is a, this is a paper by um, Jeff Gordon's lab out of Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and it's about differences in microbiome in um, heavy and lean mice. Now, these two mice that you see on the left, one of them is heavy, one of them is thin. The heavy mouse is a genetically manipulated mouse. It's called an OBOB mouse because it is genetically programmed to be an obese mouse. Uh, the other is just a regular lean mouse, um, and these are the two mice that they studied. The first thing they did um, is they took a look at what the microbiome looked like in these two different types of mice. Um, as you can see in the bar chart, uh, the blue were the bacteria that were more prevalent in the obese mice, and the green were the bacteria that were more prevalent in the lean mice. 
And as you can see, similar to what we saw in the population in Burkina Faso compared to Italy, the Bacteriodides group is higher in the lean mice and the Firmicutes group, uh, which is the first one, um, is higher in the obese mice. And so the microbiota were different in these two different types of mice, which really surprised them. But is it cause and effect, really? Or is this, again, just a coincidence? Well, they set out to determine that. And the first thing they did is they started uh, with an obese mouse. And this seems really strange, but it's a great experiment. Um, they extracted the microbiome from the mouse. They actually took the material out of the mouse's um, intestine, and they put it in a recipient that was thin. And then what happened? They ended up with a fat mouse. <laughs> yes, they did. Uh, this was breakthrough. Nobody had ever seen anything like this before. So they took the microbiome, transplanted it, and they ended up with a mouse that was heavier. They did the reciprocal experiment. They took a lean microbiome. Now, they didn't put it in the OB mouse. They just put it in a regular mouse, and the mouse stayed lean, and that made sure that it wasn't just extracting the microbiome that made this uh, happen in the mice. So they said, okay, we really want to understand this better. We want to understand if this can be a diet-induced effect or whether it's just really a genetic effect from um, the heavy mice being genetically heavy. So what they did is they took two mice. One they fed a Western diet that's high fat, high sugar. The other they fed um, a low fat, high fiber diet. Um, and that included things that um, would be high fiber like you would get um, from a, in a human diet um, from fruits and vegetables, um, legumes and things like that. Did the same sort of experiment, extracted the microbiome, uh, put it in recipient mice that were lean, um, and then, of course, what do you think happened? Yeah, the first one on the Western diet when uh, all, all they did is they took the microbiome and transplanted it. They kept the mouse on a regular diet, not on a Western diet, and the mouse became heavy. On the low-fat, high-fiber diet, the microbiome transfer showed that the mouse stayed lean. Um, this was, in 2006, this was breakthrough. And I said in my graduate research, this is the kind of work I want to do. Um, and so that's how I ended up where I am. Now let's look at what they actually saw when they looked at the microbiome differences. Um, Firmicutes were way up. And I'm actually going to have to be bad and take my glasses off to even see. I, I can't see that one, and I'm having a hard time seeing this one. The Firmicutes were way up, and they're the dark bar in the Western diet. Um, and CHO um, and Western. And then uh, what you also see is on the Western diet, there is one particular type of Firmicutes uh, molecules, uh, which were up, and that's in C. And I'm going to use A and C on those two. So C is a group called molecules. That group is now called erysipelatrichi, and we will talk about them again in a minute. Um, the other thing that was important is the diversity of the microbiome. That's how many different types of bacteria are there was a lot lower in the Western diet, and lower diversity has been associated with chronic disease. So the, the fewer types of bacteria you have in your gut, the more likely it is uh, that you have chronic disease. The more types of bacteria, and it seems counterintuitive, but the more types of bacteria, the more likely you are to have a healthy microbiome. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see the clustering of the different groups. Um, and clustering is, again, a measure of similarity. It, try, it takes the microbiome and looks at how similar it is and groups according to similarity. And in this case, the diet that uh, was low fat, uh, high fiber, and the diet that was Western were grouped in different groups entirely, so none of them grouped together. Finally, the Western diet uh, transplanted mice had significantly higher increases in body fat than did the mice that were transplanted with the low-fat, high-fiber diet, and you see that in D. Um, the white bar shows um, up near 45% oh, increase in body fat, uh, whereas in the low-fat um, 
in the low fat, high fiber diet, uh, the mice were at about 27%. So that was the increase in body fat. The other thing to remember is that all mice increase in body fat as they get older, um, but that was a very significant uh, difference. So what caused this change in obesity? Um, one of the things they also did is they transplanted the microbiome from a human into the mice. First of all, they had two things they wanted to do. They wanted to see if they could get the microbiome from a human to grow in a mouse model that was germ-free, which they found out they could do. But then the second thing they wanted to do is to do the same type of diet manipulation and see with a microbiome that was from a human being, could you still get the same effect or was it something about the mouse that made them get heavy or made them, uh, made them stay lean? The answer was the human microbiota and the mice did exactly the same thing. Uh, the heavier mi microbiome from the heavier group yielded heavier mice uh, or, or from the western fed diet group and then from the low fat uh, high fiber diet you ended up with mice uh, with a leaner profile. They also wanted to figure out well what is it about this that causes the difference in microbiome. So they looked at the genes that were in the bacteria and said what are those genes doing? What are the predominant um, genes expression in that gut bacteria doing? What they found is for the mice that were on a Western diet, they were transporting a lot of sugars. So they were actually feeding the sugars through <laughs> and transporting them to the host. Um, you found in the lean and low fat diet, there were different types of degradation of compounds, um, but then you also had a uh, uh, sphingolipid metabolism, which is a cell signaling type of, uh, type of uh, compound, sphingolipid cell, uh, signal cells, and so there was a lot more cell signaling and things like that going on as opposed to transport of sugars, um, which makes a lot of sense when you're thinking about changes in uh, obesity. Now we've talked a lot about mice. What are the implications for humans? Really, even though microbiome transplantation has been used, some of you may know this, some of you may not, to treat infections. So they'll actually transplant a microbiome into a human being to treat a Clostridium um, difficile infection. That is a rare thing. So we're not going to be doing transplantation experiments on human beings anytime soon that I can imagine. So how do we actually do this? You've got lots of complex relationships that we've already talked about, um, and it's very hard in a human experiment to control all of the different things that cause variation. So you've got different effects of the genetics of the person. You've got effects from the GI environment. Um, you have large differences in other factors. I mean, all of you guys are different. You probably all eat different things. You probably all exercise differently. Um, you probably have different sleep patterns and different patterns of getting sunshine. Um, and then you've got probably the hardest factor of all, just the normal variation in the diet. Different people eat different things. And so when you bring them into a study, uh, that's a component that's very hard to control. Fortunately, um, and as I was looking at uh, doing research, this is something I thought about all the time, but fortunately, Dr. Zizel um, was conducting a study of the nutrient choline. I don't know if he talked at all about choline last week, but choline is something that he studies um, a lot, and one carbon metabolism. Um, he, in this study, he had human subjects um, where diet was very tightly controlled. And so we had one variable um, that was a very tightly controlled variable. Um, this research really offered the perfect opportunity to look at how changes in diet affect the gut microbiome in people. And so I was really excited to get to work with him on this. This is a little bit about the study design. It's hard to believe, but this was a two-month inpatient study. We actually have volunteers who came into um, the Clinical and Translational Research Center at UNC Chapel Hill, stayed for two months, and uh, were on the study um, over that entire period. So they didn't... Uh, really leave the center hardly at all. Um, that way their diets were very controlled and during this study the thing that we were looking for, the, the real goal of the study, uh, was to evaluate the factors 
that determined whether a person who, were, who was on a low choline diet got fatty liver. Because for some people, when you don't get enough choline, it's an essential nutrient, you develop fatty liver. And so we were looking at why some people got fatty liver and other people didn't get fatty liver. And a lot of this was looking at the genetic reasons that that might be the case. All of the subjects in the, stu in the study were on a three-day diet rotation. Everybody was on exactly the same diet, exactly the same diet over the entire course of the study. Um, so you had three phases of the study. The first phase, everyone received um, an adequate daily intake of choline. That phase of the study lasted 10 days. In the second phase of the study, subjects received diets that were very low in choline. So um, very low, low enough to develop fatty liver if you're susceptible to it. They stayed on the diet until um, they, we could determine whether or not by MRI they developed liver fat. And if they did, they were taken off that diet and they were placed on a diet with high levels of choline to get their choline levels back up. Now, not, this is not really harmful to people as long as you're very careful and monitor them, and that's what Dr. Zizel did. Now, all of this was very good, but I was interested in how does that affect the microbiome? Because I had this theory, having looked at all of the research that was done in mice, that when you change the diets and everybody was on the same diet, their microbiome would start to look the same. We'll see whether that theory worked or not. <laughs> so I was interested in the microbiome, and we took samples. And you can see each of the Vs um, on the chart show when the samples were taken. So we got one before they ever started the same diets. We got one after they had been on the same diet for 10 days. Uh, we got two when they were in the depletion phase. And we sometimes got one, sometimes two, uh, when they were at the end and they got their choline levels back up. Now, I'll tell you just a little bit very quickly whoops, about choline. Um, it's an essential nutrient. It does all kinds of things. Um, it's a methyl donor, which means that it can alter how a gene is transcribed so that the protein that comes out of the gene um, is not the same or that it is actually turned off, that gene is turned off. So it can do that kind of thing. It is a component of something called chylomicrons, and chylomicrons take lipids out of your intestinal tract, transport them to other areas of the body so that it gives you en energy. Um, it's a precursor of acetylcholine. Acetylcholine um, helps with nerve signaling, so that's very important. Um, it's a signaling molecule in and of itself, um, and it's a component of cell membranes. But the thing they were most interested in was choline or phosphatidylcholine is required to transport very low-density um, lipoprotein, so LDL, but very LDL, out of the liver. So it actually takes it out of the liver, and that's the mechanism through which fatty liver develops if you don't have enough of this. Um, when you disrupt choline meta metabolism, all kinds of bad things can happen. Um, you can end up, and this is disruption over a long period of time, you can end up with neural tube effects in infants born to mothers who have disrupted choline metabolism. Um, atherosclerosis um, is another outcome of disrupted choline metabolism. Hepatic cancer, um, breast cancer has been associated with it, and in this case, non-alcoholic fatty liver. So what did we see? Well, interestingly, the thing that I was least interested in uh, when I started this research was probably the thing that ended up being most interesting. Um, there was this bacterium that we've seen before called erysipelatricky. If you remember, it was associated with the uh, diets that were higher in fat in the mice, so erysipelatricky. And what we found is that how much erysipelatricky you had in your microbiome determined how much fatty liver, actually I shouldn't say determined because that's cause and effect, was associated with how much fatty liver you ended up developing when your choline levels were low. So the diagram that you see, um, the lowest amount um, of erysipelatricky is down on the right-hand side. It's the x-axis. The y-axis is the change in fatty liver when you put, were put on a choline deficient diet. And you can see that those who had the least bacteria in this particular group, erysipelatricky, had the least fatty liver 
and those with the most erysipelal tricky had the most fatty liver in our study. I was also wanting to get back to my original idea about the diets and whether or not you can make everybody's microbiome look the same by putting everybody on a common diet. It's an interesting idea. It's probably not a very good idea. Um, <laughs> and so what, you, what we found in this um, is that, in fact, a similar diet, a standard diet, does not equal a common microbiome. Um, what we found is this particular, it's called a dendrogram, it's hierarchical clustering dendrogram. Again, we're grouping things that are similar together. Each subject samples are a different color. Um, so if you look over on the far right-hand side, subject 28 is dark red. If you look over on the far, excuse me, the far left-hand side, the far right-hand side, um, you have, let me see, subject 38, 33, maybe, um, is in orange. And the thing that you notice most about this is none of the colors mix. So the microbiota were all different and stayed different throughout the entire dietary intervention study. So we manipulated their choline levels, and actually we're finding bacteria like choline a lot, but it did not end up making them the same in any way, shape, or form. They still, still all stayed different. So does this say that all of this research in mice just isn't true? Does it matter? Actually, no. Um, and this is how we showed it. Okay. This diagram, each circle, each donut is, a, is one person, okay? Going from the inner ring of the donut, you see you've got several rings for each subject, to the outer ring is going from the beginning of the study inside to the end of the study outside. So you're going from beginning inside to end outside. And the colors show the different types of bacteria in the samples for each of those time points going from the beginning of the study to the end of the study. What you'll notice is that everybody's microbiome changes, just not enough to make them alike. So everybody saw a change, just like we did with the mice and their microbiome when they were on different diets. They just didn't all respond the same way to the same diet. And so that was very surprising. And the results confirmed that, like I said at the beginning, everybody's gut microbiome is very individual and very distinct, like a fingerprint. Everybody is different. Now, I've got some conclusions I want to go through. First of all, and probably um, one of the most interesting things to me, is that like an environment, human beings are a biosystem. Um, we have interactions in our bodies. We have living creatures in our bodies that change how our food um, is digested, the nutrition we get out of our food. Um, it changes all sorts of things about our um, physical beings, um, whether or not we uh, develop chronic diseases like diabetes or atherosclerosis or fatty liver. Um, the microbiome has an effect on that. So we are an environment, a biosystem. The second thing, which is kind of a geeky thing, is that sequencing technology has really improved our understanding of this biosystem. And we are at the cusp. Um, the study that I referred to first, the one with the heavy and the lean mice, was in 2006. And that was one of the first studies that really showed health effects um, out of sequencing of the bacteria in the microbiome. So it was very important, but it wasn't that long ago, and things are getting better and faster, and we're starting to see more associations, um, and that has implications for potentially how we treat diseases, because the microbiome is changeable, as we saw in a lot of the different experiments that were done, and if it's changeable, it may be that we can have an effect on how we develop disease over time or don't develop disease over time with treatments with things such as probiotics and prebiotics, which is another whole area that I'm interested in that I didn't 
didn't get into it all tonight. A lot of the biosystem property, properties are transmitted at birth, um, and that includes immunity. Um, there's a lot about immunity that develops as a result of the microbiome because the gut is such a big immune system organ. Many factors uh, really impact the development of the microbiome um, and also uh, how it interacts with the body over the course of a lifetime. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, your individual microbiome affects your health. And so it's important to think about all of the things that people tell you all the time um, about taking care of your health, but you're also doing it through your microbiome, and it's important to understand um, that it has an effect on how your health goes too. Thank you very much. Okay, questions. <laughs> I'm sorry? There are, there are similarities in people who have certain diseases in the microbiome of the people who have certain diseases. This is a very new area. Um, a lot of work is currently being done on metabolic syndrome, which includes things like high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, um, and other conditions of that type. And it's a syndrome that goes together. Um, fatty liver is one of them. One of the things that has just recently come out, in fact, it was last Thursday um, in the journal Nature, um, is a study that shows um, that, in fact, the microbiome um, actually, not just in an environment where you have uh, culling deficiency, is associated with fatty liver, and it talks about inflammation um, that is mediated by the gut microbiome that is one of the sources of fatty liver development. It's a disease called NAFLD, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and that inflammation trigger um, is part of what uh, really um, causes the disease, and that's that's from the microbiome and from changes to the microbiome uh, that are inflammatory. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yes. What kind of effect does probiotics have in the health of your colon? Yeah. Um, I will. Uh, she asked, what is the effect of probiotics um, on the microbiome? So the probiotics that you see in health food stores um, and there are a lot of different types of probiotics. You can have probiotics in pill form. You can have probiotic yogurt. And in fact, all yogurt that has culture is somewhat probi probiotic. Um, that's been around for centuries. Um, the effects on health are still um, under study. The people who have done the most work on probiotics are the Europeans. Um, and they have done a lot of work on the effects of yogurt. What they found is generally that probiotic um, influences are transient. They are beneficial, but if you eat one cup of yogurt, the bacteria that are there, often lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, don't stay. <laughs> um, they are there for a little while and then they go away. Um, and fortunately for us, the same is true about antibiotics. Um, after a while, you know, you'll flush out your system with antibiotics, but then the bacteria will grow back and that's actually probably a positive thing for us. Um, but probiotics, um, my feeling is the um, health effects of them are probably positive. Um, the lactobacillus and bifidobacteria are the types of bacteria that are good at um, short-chain fatty acids and feeding your intestines. Um, however, you have to keep eating it. And I guess the yogurt companies really like that. <laughs> Um, I eat a lot more yogurt. <laughs> I actually do. <laughs> um, and I try to eat a lot more fruits and vegetables. That was not the case tonight. I had a very quick dinner at Wendy's. I think everybody does this every once in a while. Um, but I have tried to, um, tried to eat more fruits and vegetables. Um, I do eat a whole lot less sugar, but I am a chocolate addict. 
And that is a very hard thing to break. Um, with one, with choline is one form better than another, and um, I wish I could clarify that on the web because choline is an essential nutrient, but it is also in health food supplements a lot of times. Um, but you will also find it in supplements for uh, mothers, uh, pregnant uh, pregnant women, so that they get enough uh, choline and don't have problems with neural tube defects um, and other issues uh, with pregnancy when you are deficient in choline. Um, one form better than another, I would not take a choline supplement outside of vitamins on, um, outside of vitamins um, if I were pregnant. And one of the reasons why is that it seems that too much choline um, can also not be that great for you. So it's sort of getting the right balance. You don't want too little choline because that's disease producing. You don't want too much choline because that's recently been associated with atherosclerosis. Um, again, a publication in Nature, and this is an area of very great interest to us that we've started, um, we've started doing research in. Yeah. Uh, in your early slide where you compared the diets of the people from Florence, Italy, Absolutely. Animal fat is very different, um, and it has to do with saturation. Um, but fat from animals is very different from fat from nuts. Um, there are actually fats in uh, plant, plants as well. And those types of fats your body uses much more effectively um, than it does animal fats. And so that's a very good question. Um, animal fats are uh, much more... Um, Inflam inflammatory, I guess is the best word to use, um, much more associated with disease. Um, there are a lot of, uh, now, <laughs> interestingly, a lot of these are animal, um, animal foods. So you've got things like liver and meats, you've got eggs, but soy also has a lot of choline in it. Um, and actually we have a choline expert here, Karen. Are there other ones that you would say? Wheat germ. Wheat germ is another good one. Yeah. Peanut butter does have a good bit of choline in it. Oh, that one I'd never heard before. Shiitake mushrooms. So you can get it from plant-based sources too. I have not seen microbiome research on hydrogenated fats, but I have seen enough other research on hydrogenated fats that I would stay away from them. And you, I mean, you're seeing, you're seeing a lot of people, a lot of food companies remove hydrogenated fats from their foods. Um, that's a good thing. Uh, be careful, though. Sometimes they add extra sugar when they do that. Yes. <laughs> the question is, um, from the diets, it looks like you should live in Africa um, in, the, in the dietary study, but how does that actually turn out in terms of longevity? Um, I'm not sure what the longevity is in Burkina Faso, but in Africa, it is certainly a lot uh, a lot shorter lifespan um, than we have anywhere in Europe or in the developed world. Um, some of that is because you've got diseases in Africa that are tropical diseases. Some of it is because you've also got, uh, you've also got um, malnourishment that is more rampant um, in Africa than you do in most of the Western world. Um, so the longevity may not be the best measure. You've got a lot of things besides just the foods that they eat that are affecting health. Um, and a, a lot of that's from the environment that they're in. Based yeah. on the studies that are out there already, even the ones that are in the United States, um, a vegan diet, people have more longevity on a vegan diet and less of the lesser ingredients. Like 
Yes. That's interesting. I, that is not research that I've seen. That's, uh, that's very interesting. I'll have to look at that. Other questions? Um, he wants to know, how do you know if you're deficient in choline and what sorts of tests there are for it? Um, I don't know of any standard test for choline deficiency, Karen. Do you know of any that a doctor might do? That's right. Um, what she said is if you eat a healthy diet, you're probably not choline deficient. And um, she, Karen also said we're one of the few labs in the world that has tests for choline um, in human subjects. Um, doctors, it's just not something that they actually test for. One last question. Yeah. What she asks is, when you go into a gastroenterologist with an intestinal problem or heartburn, how does what we're talking about here um, have an impact on how that doctor might treat you with either a medication or with um, some sort of dietary change? Um, a lot of times the doctors are very ready to treat with something like, uh, pre uh, is it Prevacid? Uh, that is a proton pump inhibitor and helps prevent the acid in your stomach from um, kind of overworking. It also has its long-term consequences, um, and I am not an expert on this. I'm learning about gastroenterology up at Chapel Hill, but I haven't learned it all yet, um, and that part I don't know a whole lot about. Um, but I do know that there are side effects from having um, something like Prevacid or uh, what is it, the purple pill? <laughs> um, Nexium, that's it. Um, that actually when you stop taking it, the acid increases in your stomach um, and you have almost a bounce back effect. And so you really, once you start it, you have to uh, stay on it for a long time. Now gastroenterologists teaching about the microbiome or using the microbiome um, as a means of treatment, um, I have not seen a lot of that except in research hospitals. Um, the folks I work with in Chapel Hill, Balfour Sartor is one of them, and he is a um, kind of world-renowned gastroenterologist who um, treats Crohn's, di Crohn's disease and actually has Crohn's disease, um, and he does use a diet and microbiome manipulation to try to treat his Crohn's disease patients um, in Chapel Hill. Um, but other than actual research scientists who are also doctors, um, I haven't seen that used very much, um, but that may just be uh, my limited scope. Okay. okay. Sure. Do you know anything about celiac disease or what repair work do you do for actually treating such um, undiagnosed people? Celiac is very hard, um, and I only know a little bit about it. Um, it is an issue with gluten in the diet. Um, there is a response where your small intestine uh, breaks down the villi, which are what absorb the nutrients from your food. Um, and so when you have celiac disease, you're not, you aren't absorbing nutrients very well. Um, and really the only thing I know um, that you can do about it is to eliminate gluten from your diet. Um, that's what the gastroenterologist that I know would recommend. I've only, I've seen a research presentation on it. Um, and what they recommend is complete elimination of gluten if you can possibly do it. It is not an easy thing to do. I have a friend who has uh, celiac, and it's very hard for her to do something like go out to a restaurant. Fortunately, the restaurants are starting to have gluten-free uh, meals, which is very good. I hope that answers your question. That's a hard one. Uh, the repairs, what? 
Yeah. The repair, I don't know anything about. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure once you've broken down um, the, the villi in the intestine if you are able to repair it or not. Um, that is not my area of expertise, and I wish I could help you with that. Um, but I don't know if there's a good way to repair it or if they'll kind of regenerate if they don't have the gluten um, exposure any longer. Thank you. Thank you all.